I recently made a video about when you don't get a popular game. In it, I referenced the Soulsborne games, having what I believe to be incredibly precise controls. Until that video, I had never met anyone who felt differently, but it turns out a really efficient way to have someone disagree with you is to publish an opinion on the internet. For someone to use the word clunky in relation to movement in any of the From Software catalogue was baffling to me. I figured it had to be a matter of perspective, like when you've been driving on the motorway and then you drop back down to 30 and it feels like your car is barely moving. So I trolled through the comments, found the nicest one, and asked what sort of games they usually played to make Souls games feel clunky by comparison. A couple of polite and helpful responses later, and I was able to pick up what these helpful commenters were putting down. Examples cited were the likes of God of War, Devil May Cry, and Bayonetta. Immediately, the one key difference that jumped out at me was stamina. A huge part of the Soulsborne DNA is stamina management. Almost every action has a price, to make you really think about what you're doing, to teach you control, to force you away from panic rolling and button mashing. Every action is designed to have a deliberate feel to it. It was at this point that I internally facepalmed myself so goddamn hard, because in the same video, I referenced the Red Dead Redemption 2 controls and how they felt clunky to me, and realised I was describing a game with a slower, more deliberate feel to it, occasionally busting out its own stamina meters for good measure. Was that a pun? I'm not sure. Moving on. The likes of God of War have no such restriction on your movements. There is no limit to how much you can run, attack or roll before you have to cool down and none of this is changed depending on the weight of your equipment. I thought back on the many different games I have experienced in my 40 years on this earth. I considered games I had written off because the movement didn't feel right, like it didn't have enough weight to it or it just felt janky. I remembered how back in my Call of Duty days, the Black Ops games always seemed to feel floatier than the Modern Warfare installments. I remembered Final Fantasy XIII and wondered how much of the way that game felt was due to always being able to hear the clip-clop of Lightning's footsteps. Then you have different perspectives. First and third person games, 2D games such as Celeste or Super Mario, and even he feels drastically different when he switches over to 3D. Honestly, this was a rabbit hole that just never stopped giving. The more I looked, the more it became apparent that when movement is done right, it is all about making you feel like your character. A statement unfortunately memified into ruin by IGN, but I kept coming back to it all the same. Controlling an on-screen character needs to feel natural, intuitive. We the gamer want autonomy without having to think about it, but we also want the character to feel like who they're supposed to be. Take Kratos for example. This dude very clearly knows how to lift. He most definitely rides the Swoller Coaster. If he was a wizard, he would be Lord Swoldemort. You get my point. The guy is more than sufficiently quick on his feet, but he has a weight to him too. With heavier characters, there's a general expectation for them to feel weightier. But again, how a character is meant to feel can absolutely supersede all of this. The Doomslayer is more than buff enough to bro down with the likes of Kratos, but his movement is so fast and so glidey that the first time you push that left stick forward, you probably had to check the settings to make sure you hadn't accidentally slipped on the sensitivity meter. If you're like me, however, you quickly realise that this is how the Doomslayer is supposed to feel, especially when you start parkouring around the arenas. Standing still in Doom 2016 or Doom Eternal will very quickly get you killed, so it makes sense to design movement that empowers you rather than adds another challenge for you to work against. On the other end of the scale, you have Nier Automata, where your steampunk-loving androids also move at a blistering pace, but nothing about them implies that they would move any differently. However a developer chooses to make their character feel, it's important that it is done right and that it feels right within the context of the game, and most of all, that it feels satisfying. I'm very hesitant to bash on Mass Effect Andromeda, because I did enjoy it, and here's the Platinum Trophy to prove it, and I think the developers did the best job they could, in a project that wasted three and a half of the five years it was allocated, and who were forced to create a third-person game using an engine made for first-person shooters, but with every step you took in the Andromeda Galaxy, it never quite felt right, and you just knew that it could have been done better. 
The type of game that you're playing will heavily influence the style of movement that it employs. If you take any of the Assassin's Creed games for example, third person stealth action adventure games, the movement needs to feel light and fluid. You need to be able to effortlessly chain different movements as you climb structures, and you need to be able to smoothly transition into low profile movements without having to sacrifice too much of your speed. Now let's look at Dishonored 2. A stealth action adventure game where you can spend the whole game in low profile, never letting yourself be seen, or charge in and expertly juggle multiple enemies in open combat. If it sounds like I'm describing Assassin's Creed again, it's because the key difference I haven't mentioned yet is that Dishonored 2 is played in first person. In third person you can of course see all around your character, and that level of awareness damn near makes you omniscient compared to the same experience in first person. Where you cannot see behind you, where you have to peek through keyholes and around corners to have any idea of what's coming. In Dishonored 2 your movement is far more deliberate. You feel every step that you take as you crouch, run and jump your way through the city of Dunwall. In a game that exists directly from your point of view, rather than one that you have a perpetual bird's eye view of, it feels right that you feel every bump, step and slide. One of the things that defined the older Resident Evil games was the developers combining the use of fixed camera angles and tank controls. In claustrophobic games where you face enemies that just keep on coming, in spite of all the precious ammo you have wasted trying to put them down, giving your characters a rudimentary movement style is a pretty genius way of ramping up the tension. Eventually you get used to it and outmaneuvering the zombies becomes second nature but on your first playthrough it really does make you weigh up whether you want to risk losing a chunk of health by trying to make a run for it. Now, making a game's movement feel like what the character should feel like is all well and good, but we also want that character to feel good. When we press a button, we want the thing to happen and we want it to happen right then in the moment. We want responsive controls. Animations are incredibly important here. Pressing a button and not having the action happen because of an obtuse animation is a clear indicator of a misunderstood assignment. A good developer works hard to find a balance. Some games allow you to run by default, but if you apply a lesser amount of input on the left stick, your character will usually walk. Some games walk by default and run instead when you click the left stick or hold an accompanying button. Either way, your character will transition to full speed a lot faster than a real human would, and in most games they won't ever tire or slow down either. One thing I really do like though, is how when your character stops running they don't just stop dead like a spring stuck in the ground. They have a stop animation, with the tiniest last bit of inertia playing out before they come to a stop. It's a nice touch and one that forces you to weigh up when to walk and when to run, especially if you're playing a game that requires precision. At the start of this video I referenced games having a deliberate feel to them. Whether it's swinging a sword or mounting a horse, most games will commit you to the action for the duration of the animation. The dodge roll is synonymous with Dark Souls, and for good reason. Each roll has a period of invincibility attached to it, and these iframes can really save your neck. The roll is not a singular animation though, there are different types depending on how heavy your equipment is, with the slowest of which being the notorious fat roll. For a game like this to work, there needs to be a fair balance between the animations of your character and those of your enemies. Whether it's a disparity between your actions and those of the enemy, or your animations not being responsive enough for the prompts like dodge, parry or counter, this sort of thing can really sour an experience and result in something more commonly referred to as the enemies performing bullshit attacks. In the embrace of Mesmer's flame. Quick experiment. The next time you're outside, try jumping, changing direction in mid-air, and landing on a surface higher up than the one that you started on. I don't know what level of gravity is being exerted on video game characters when they jump, but more often than not it cannot possibly be the same as that of the Earth. I thought about this recently when I finished Super Mario Odyssey. For a game with such seemingly simple controls, the possibilities for chaining your movements together are quite remarkable, and you have a very healthy number of options to choose from here, each one having its own unique animation. The weird thing is, my internal monologue on movement didn't actually trigger until the end of the game, when you go to the moon. 
Despite hours upon hours spent watching Mario perform stunning feats of parkour, it was the reduced level of gravity on the moon that really gave me pause. Putting a character on a non-celestial body where reduced gravity is expected is one thing, but how exactly a game can keep a character's feet on the ground, but also give them Olympian levels of aerial dexterity really had me scratching my head. Fortunately, someone had already done my research for me, and as Superluck would have it, they used Mario as a test subject. I'll link the article in the physics fact book in the description for those who want to know more, but the gist of it is, getting Mario to high altitudes isn't the challenge. The challenge is getting him back down to the ground in a way that feels natural. To achieve this, the developers massively increase gravity, and the result is that whilst Mario can reach heights of over five times his height, he also descends back to ground levels at speeds that would kill a normal human. The realism is achieved by controlling his rate of descent. I'm not sure what I expected to find when I peeped behind this particular curtain, but it just goes to show the type of things developers have to account for. How an action sounds can also lend a world of difference to how an action feels. We previously referenced how the Doomslayer glides and zooms around the battlefield, but listen to what he sounds like when he grabs onto a climbable surface. That is power right there. That is a meaty boy throwing all of his weight into that wall. In terms of movement mechanics, sound will generally be quite minimal unless you're doing something special. Grappling hooks, for example, will often have a bespoke sound combined with some sort of wind element to convey speed. Using minimalistic sounds for regular movements is usually the right call though. The key thing here is to have movement sounds enhance your immersion, rather than pull you out of it. Subtle and natural sounds might seem like an afterthought for basic movement, but if you remember right at the start, I referenced Lightning's constant clip-clop footsteps in Final Fantasy XIII. Granted, I revisited the game last Christmas, so it's somewhat fresh in my mind, but still, for the love of God, woman, you're on the run from the government. Buy some quieter shoes. Now something I would have never given a second thought to prior to the PS5 is haptic feedback. Controller vibrations have always been fine and all in my opinion, but said opinion has never really stretched beyond that. Today however, it never ceases to amaze me just how much our controllers can convey simply through vibration, and keeping time with your footsteps has become a common inclusion. Capturing the feel of your character through their movement has come up a lot today. Whether it's the tiniest of vibrations to indicate a raindrop falling on your character, or a full-on stable current running through your hands whenever you use Astro Bot's boost jump, I think it's such a cool little extra, and the devs who make this stuff happen deserve a lot more credit than they get, especially the ones behind Astro Bot. As we start to wind down this video, I'd like to give special mention to all of those bespoke movements out there, like the grappling hook we mentioned a few moments ago. Take everything that we have discussed so far, the feel, the style, the animation, the sound, and then apply it all to a movement not found in the traditional human range of movements. Sekiro is all about stealth, so his grapple is as stealthy as it is satisfying, compared to Reboot Dante whose vertical traversal equipment is born of raw celestial slash demonic power. Nothing about his grapple arm or the world he uses it in implies that this movement is going to be quiet, and rightly so, it isn't. Dishonored 2 has so many ridiculously cool gadgets and magic powers to make use of, the most fundamental of which are probably the teleport powers. That's teleport powers plural, because each character has their own that does the same thing, but stylistically and visually very differently. And I love that, and personally much prefer Emily's massive shadow hand. Something feels wrong. Whenever I publish a new video, people will disagree with at least some of it. And that's fine, I'm always open to dialogue. And if someone decides to be a dick, then me writing this line is the full extent to which I care about their opinion. Every now and then though, some of this discourse really gives me pause, and following up on the assertions that I was wrong to call Souls games precise, turned out to be a worthwhile journey. 
I'm glad I looked further into the reasoning behind some of the facets of movement in video games, and I'm also glad for those of you who chose to comment in a mature manner, because I probably wouldn't have done so otherwise. Thank you as always for watching my friends, I will see you on the next one.